So, Beauty Jones, thank you so, so much to be again with Portuguese audience and all over the world, but through a Portuguese event. Um, my first question uh, is a, con a question with contextualization. Um, I was um, noticing some moments in your life as a person and as an artist with such a rich experience. Um, and uh, there are some really uh, changing moments that I think can help us think about what we are living now. One aspect is the fact that you leave the counterculture when you are a teenager. Mm -hmm. uh, also, after that, after thinking that everything was possible, discovering freedom, uh, there, then came AIDS mm -hmm. a long time after. Um, you are doing a, a very political uh, piece, Last Supper at Uncle Tom's Cabin, The Promised Land, in 1990, just after uh, Arnie Zayn died of AIDS. Mm -hmm. And uh, we still remember very strongly, uh, still here, that you did in 1994, and that was presented in Lisbon in 1995, oh. uh, which is a piece that uh, started with the survival workshops uh, mm -hmm. for people that were dealing or have had dealt, dealt with a life-threatening disease. Yes. Um, all this and something more, um, gives you a perspective, I imagine, a very particular perspective on what we are living now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think so. You know, I, I hear this, uh, and th I'm very honored to be uh, part of the uh, this Boca uh, online. Uh, I was thinking, that, is there any person who um, has been doing a thing for all of their life that you could not look at their life and say that it is rich? Uh, artists, uh, artists like myself, I know that because I started as a migrant worker and then my, uh, and I'm a black man in uh, a country like America, which has real problems. I do know that it was a big deal when I decided I did not want to uh, become a doctor or something, but I was going to be an artist. Nobody knew what that was. The reason I ask that, what am I trying to get at right now is when I speak to, um, people now, my, the young, my young performers, for instance, and I try to talk to them about the surprise in life, and I try to talk about uh, what courage is, uh, there is, it's difficult not to become a bit overbearing, mm. as if I have some knowledge that you don't have. I think the thing that's most important is that what we need is the ability to ask the right questions at all times in life. And we do need a curiosity. Yes, we're all born with the same uh, two arms, two legs. We're, uh, we are endowed by a creator with certain inalienable rights as our constitution, right? Uh, but what makes a difference in certain people? What makes the difference? And I think that's what we're here talking about on one level. Uh, do you feel like, does one feel they're a member, a part of something? This is a big one I level up my, my young dancers to try to get them riled up. What, uh, are you a part of a community? They will say, we're a part of a dance company. I said, no, I don't mean a dance company. That's your job. But do you feel like you're in this world that you're part of a community? Being a black American, I was forced on me. I fought it for a long time. You are a minority. You are a woman, right? And then, you are an artist, then you are a dancer. All these categories, some of them are forced on you. And then some of them you wear with courage and pride. So um, we'll come back to this more, but there's something about what gives me the authority to be talking to you today is what I'm trying to, is what I'm trying to get at. I'm honored. Well, you talked about a lot of questions that I could uh, start a lot of different questions, but I started with one that you refer to. Sometimes you have to know the right question to ask. Mm -hmm. And when you did the survival workshops, the question you asked, the approached 
the, the way you approached these people was you have something special that you know and that you are specialized on and they reacted straightly what do we know <laughs> yes so, and I, and, yes and, and I, said, us a, I, <clears throat> I said that i'm a man uh who needs us to have an artist and a man who needs his hand held because at that time i was afraid for my own life and i came to them as a group of experts because they had dealt with this big question of our mortality and they had found a way to live with it. I said, do you think that you have a knowledge that the world does not have? And they said, well, there is a thing we, we as sick, we have people of dealing with a difficult illness, we call it the arrogance of the well. Yes, that's one thing. But they also say that, uh, yes, we do have knowledge, but we wish we didn't have to pay so dearly to have it. And that was very important to hear uh, from a woman who had a, a child and had a breast cancer and, and breast cancer would take her life. Uh, another woman who um, was, uh, many of the women came from breast cancer, of course, men who were dealing with different diseases like HIV being one of them. And they said that they felt that they had some knowledge, but they wish they didn't have to pay so much to have it. Do I feel that way? I don't know, I grew up in a, a family where and my mother was constantly down on her knees praying to a God that seemed rather cruel to her. She had to beg God to, to uh, take care of her. I mean, if he created you, why do you have to beg for your life? Well, she said, the world, life is a veil of sorrow, uh, a, a path that we have to walk through. And if we behave properly, then you will be rewarded on high. Don't look for it in this world, but the next world. I thought that was very strange, but I think about it sometime. Yeah, the, what, life is a veil of sorrow. I wonder how young people feel now about that, and particularly in the corona, um, the COVID epidemic. Is this just what it means to be alive? I couldn't say no. I don't want to say yes, but I could not say no. I was wondering uh, one aspect, um, this, this arrogance of the well that mm -hmm. I think was also particular of that era uh, when there was the, the when I started and mm -hmm. was that these misconceptions, the prejudices and all of that, and uh, um, you you said you did that still here, for uh, so that people would understand that this is not something that just happens to a group of people. The others, mm -hmm. this is something that we all uh, share our mortality. But AIDS reminded you again that you belong to the others. Mm -hmm. You mean an outsider? Always, an outsider. Yeah, and a dubious group. In other words, was AIDS punishment from God? Was there something that I and my uh, uh, co-sufferers uh, I were having? Were we, were we doing something that we deserved what happened to us? Uh, you know, I used to say, no, no, hell no. Uh, now I, and I, and people didn't understand why I would become so belligerent and angry, you know? Don't make me a diseased outsider. Do not do that. You have no right to do that. Now, it's very interesting. Many people, are they asking themselves a moral question? Do we ha deserve what's happening to us now? And that is, that, it's maybe even too early to say, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I, I was going to, to, to ask you that question because um, I, I feel that uh, that mission that you, that you that urgency that you had on that time uh, is different now because it can happen to any one of us. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you know, I love that. I love it and I also resent it because yeah. uh, uh, when I say to people, well, you know, this is my second plague and they'll yeah. say, yes, well, AIDS was different. Now, we don't usually have time to stop and talk about why was it different? 
Well, there was a minority of people that because of their lifestyle, they had this happen to them. Now it's happening to all of us. Well, if you believe what the ecologists tell us, the air is cleaner in places. There, I hear that there are now uh, dolphins in, in, yeah. uh, in, in, in Venice and that you can see fish in the canals and all. So we obviously have all been sinning, right? That the world is so uh, polluted and we even think that this part of our sin has been the way in which we have been living with animals, living, um, using animals without any uh, sense of there being a cost. And that is where the virus started. So guilt, is that what we're talking about now? Is this, is this a guilty plague like AIDS was a guilty plague? Uh, I don't know. I feel... I, I, I dodged a bullet on the first one. I feel like a very lucky man. And I am an older man now. I was a younger man then. I felt I had all of life in front of me. I was being robbed of something. Now I am a man that thinks about, artists don't do this, but I'm a man who thinks about retiring, about do I do not have to make, I do not have to be on uh, <laughs> talking to <laughs> journalists from across the world. I could, um, do I feel that I am guilty um yes and no i love my pleasure i love my car i love being able to eat the food i want to eat i love all of those things that modern people those those of us who have the good fortune to live what we call in this country the the one percent yeah you know uh yeah. i love that and but by the same token am i willing to give up anything to make the world better well, that's hard. I find I'm very self-centered, very selfish. So uh, AIDS never taught me to be more generous. Will COVID teach me to be more generous? So do I deserve what's happening? I don't know. It, this is where the I begins to fail. And we are tempted to talk about we. What do we deserve? Gay men were told you are an abomination. Every world religion is against you. This is what they would say. So you can see that now you're being punished with a great plague. Well, who has been wagging their finger at the present world? The way you, you eat too much beef. Yeah. You are, you're too many of you. You are polluting. You all deserve what's happening to you. I wonder how are people talking about this? This social distancing some conversations don't get had. I read them in the paper. Yeah. The, the, the aspect of some conversations are not being had. And mm -hmm. I would like to ask you, the other aspect of this uh, pand pandemic is this aspect of uh, not touching, not being able to touch, not being present, uh, this uh, distancing of the body, Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is very particular and uh, all the com I was uh, also reading when you did uh, for example in two uh, 2005 blind diet you were mm -hmm. uh, talking to your dancers about uh, because there were there had been the election of the re-election of George W. Bush and mm -hmm. uh, there was the discussion of questions <laughs> of gender of uh, of the the freedom of the body, uh, like mm -hmm. abortion and uh, uh, rice, all that, and you came to ask to the to the dancers how they felt was the narrative about the body that was being uh, um, discussed in the politics, and how the artists were being seen uh, mm -hmm. with mistrust mm -hmm. by the politicians, and that now there are two aspects: the body is there cannot be touch, there cannot be the, the, this aspect of touching is out of the question. Mm. And where is the debate about the body and about the artists? Now, uh, you're asking, is there a relationship between the body and the artist at any time, or and particularly in a plague? What do you mean? In, in this plague in particular, 
Mm. The mm -hmm. fact that the body is, is in quarantine, the body is in quarantine, mm -hmm. uh, even in kind of almost opposite uh, position as in AIDS, where uh, it came out of this freedom of uh, uh, intimacy yeah. and sexuality and all that. Now mm -hmm. it's the opposite. Bodies have to be distanced them all. Well, and Claudia, you know, Claudia, your question is a good one, but I think we should we should adjust it a little bit adjust. because when when it first <clears throat> when the uh, plague came to into my life, um, uh, we and, and I had to stop working on my work, the new work, the Deep Blue Sea, the curriculum, the Holland Festival, all those things. Uh, I felt very angry, very sad. And uh, people told me, they said, you know, what you're feeling right now is a kind of grief. Hmm. Grief, I know, having lost uh, many people. But they also said that this is an opportunity for us to slow down, think, become more introspective, think about uh, the world. And then, and now, I realize uh, that social distancing is a social privilege now that has changed my understanding of the body what bodies cannot social distance what cannot and now we're back to questions that never leave us who are the caretakers who does the i dare say this shit work who cleans the toilets who drives the buses who um has to leave her children at home to go take care of my dying mother-in-law. So um, COVID has revealed now not only the problems of the body as AIDS revealed, we could no longer share body fluids. I don't think straight people ever really heard it though. They didn't think it had anything to do with them. But now we understand that uh, COVID and being able to move away from COVID is only if you can afford to do it. Other people are not able to. Therefore, the disease is now sociopolitical, as they always are. Now, that correction being said, now, would you like to restate your question about the relationship of the body to politics at this time? Yes, maybe the second part of the question is being, as you say, uh, being this uh, a disease that has a social political connotation, where does the debate that was happening about the body and uh, the questions of race, the questions of freedom of gender, uh, equality, no. all that, that was very uh, alive. We are not discussing that. Where is the, mm -hmm. the debate about that? Mm -hmm. And where are the arts in this? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I think, uh, well, uh, two things. I think that the those questions of the the powerful and the less powerful, rich and poor, those questions are always with us. And this is one thing that this epidemic is teach, teaching: that those ideas that are social, political, are always with us. And I know I have made many people angry by my dance work. There have been people who said, "Oh, the work is more about politics than it is about art." Nobody yeah. says that. Nobody says that anymore. That was something that we had to learn. Even the esthetes who love the ballet, the ballet, the ballet, realize mm -hmm. that the ballet is made of bodies that are not all equal. Women's bodies, what color are the people on stage? What does it cost to have a ticket to the ballet? Who does it speak? Who's tradition? So that's, that's one thing. It's just reminding us certain things never go away. We want to forget them, but they never go away. And then it is asking the question, um, what would I be willing to give up? And that is a hard question. It was a question we were asking around um, the, after our last election, when we had this proto-fascist be voted in. And uh, we realized that our whole electoral system was corrupt in a certain way, that a person like this, who lost the popular vote could actually be the president. And he has made a change around the world that I, I, I'm very sad about. So the artist, 
artists have some accounting to do. Artists are supposed to be the freest. Artists are supposed to be the bravest. Artists are supposed to be as the great um, curator from the Museum of Modern Art, uh, Kirk Varnado said to me, artists are faster than the rest of us. Artists, we must trust artists because they can smell something in the way that we cannot. Well, where were the artists around this issue? And does the artist help us now understand the social political aspect of uh, social distancing is a privilege. It happens for people who are able to afford it. Good health care. Where are the artists do, uh, that they should be? I've given them this kind of position, of elevated position. Do we deserve it? We have got to prove again and try to earn it again, this respect. We've got to, and I don't think the art world, the visual art world is money driven, as you well know, right? Um, then it's a joke almost, uh, the visual art world. The, the visual the, art world, yes. Yes, it, I love uh, visual arts, but it is- It's a huge market, market, yes. Yeah, it's a market, it's a market. In, the, in my field, embodied, which is what we call it at, in my theater, we don't say um, dance, we say embodied investigation. Who are your, who is your audience? Are you really making those experimentations and discoveries you're making in your downtown uh, avant-garde spaces? Is it making any difference? And I, I don't know if art has to make a difference, but I want mine to. Every artist has got to answer that for themselves. So that's what this, this is, uh, artists, I would like to say they're really, really important, but they've got to prove to me that they are making a difference at this time, social distancing or not. But don't you, do you think that, uh, especially in embodied experimentation, mm -hmm. um, that this is a universe that is very fragile in terms of uh, simple existence, financial existence mm -hmm, and this mm -hmm. um this coronavirus and i know you know also a little about how european funding for the arts functions that is very different from how uh, north american uh, funding functions don't you feel that uh, uh, artists the ones that are working with their bodies is threatened in terms of survival financial, simple day-to-day -day survival? Mm -hmm. Oh, they are, we definitely are, we are. And I asked this question of my um, administration at New York Live Arts, when this, uh, when we move to the next phase of this new world and people, and we are constantly begging for money, because we do, we have to go out and plead our case to rich people, um, why would they choose the work that happens in my theater over a food bank or teaching children? Or uh, why would they choose it, you know? Yeah. And, and I think it sounds like a self-flagellating comment, but um, that's what I think artists have to do, ask questions like that. Am I, um, do I have to, what do I have to give to society? for society to take care of my fragile body, my fragile ecosystem. What do I have to do for people to even care what the experimentation I'm doing is? Now, I don't know the answer. And we, we talk about this a lot at New York Live Arts. I'm sure it's around the world. People want art that entertains them. I mean, they do, they do. They pay big dollars for it, right? Uh, is that what we should be doing? Entertaining people. Uh, I'm, I'm too angry to entertain, you know, because I'm a very angry person, but that's why I make the art that I make. Uh, I do want to be loved. Therefore, I want the work to have a certain attraction. Um, and people must always know that there is a human being, like the one that's speaking to you right now, who has big questions about what, how, and why of life. That this person is, in a way, like you. But this person maybe has something that you don't have, which is uh, maybe a, a kind of daring, 
or bravery or madness? <laughs> do you value, I'm speaking to the potential audience or the funders, do you value, do you value those things, the madness that this group um, stands for? Can you have a democracy without a class of mad people who are trying things, failing, who are trying again? and it has very little market value. Do you, this is after COVID, if there is going to be time, do you value that group enough to take care of them? Are they like the new priest in your culture? These are the questions I think, um, I'm very interested in seeing how they will be answered. I would just uh, uh, take this moment to say to everyone that is, uh, watching this conversation that they can now, we are now opening the space for people to write some question if they want, they have for Bilty Jones. Uh, I'm going to try to be in this too, <laughs> attentive to, to both of um, um, these two. Uh, um, I already have one question here, <laughs> Bilty Jones, so I, I haven't read it before, so I'm just sharing. Um, uh, as a musician performer, this is Rafael Aires, uh, a musician performer, how can one use your body from a place of isolation as a resistance tool? Would you recommend any practice on that? Thanks mm. for that. <laughs> I'm sure there are wiser people than I. Uh, what is the gentleman's name again? Rafael Aires. Raphael, right? Uh, well, one thing that I have learned is to keep my sanity. If I am able to social distance, I must keep an organized world. I must get up every day. I must have goals for the day. I must um, use the media that we have to try to speak to other people. This is just for mental health. Artists have a lot of problems with that. I notice in my company, People are very young, talented people who are shut up in the, the small spaces, but they're being asked to do, as Janet Wong, my associate artistic director and I do, we give them assignments to keep them working on their tool, which is their body, to keep them creating, thinking. Now, as a musician, I, do you, uh, are you satisfied with one person listening to something that you do sincerely? If so, that is your new religion, that you want to make sure that you are able to provide at least one person a direct connection to a working, sincere artist. Other than that, there is no guidebook yet to tell you how to do it. I'm, cu I'm curious, and, if, and this is a musician, I'm curious how I do a body-based art online. Can you really feel the muscles? Can you feel gravity? Can you hear the breathing, the sweat, all those things which I love? We, this is, this is our problem in my world. How do we make this medium that we're now set with, how can it communicate that basic animal nature of live performance? You know, we're very brave though in the dance world. I see people trying all sorts of wild things um, and that is a good thing. But do I have a formula? No, I actually envy you, Rafael. I envy you, particularly if you play one instrument and you play it well, you can reach a lot of people. It's much more difficult for us in our bodies. I was rem rem remembering that you also have experience with uh, the body and technology. You did the ghost catching project, uh, which is completely different when you try experiment something with technologies, when mm -hmm. that is an option, an aesthetic option, then when you are confined to the impossibility of uh, using the body in, in, in physical space. But I, ju was, I just rem uh, remembered now that you also have that. Uh... What I have is curiosity. And the curiosity says, where are the questions about what this body, this time-based uh, accoutrement, if you will, it's going, it was born and it will die. Can you use, any and all means to sing its praises, to reveal what it can do, what the arms can do, hands can do. What is a pause in movement? 
Um, I feel that uh, that is my challenge right now, trying to understand how the technology can help me extend what live performance can do. And it's very early yet. I think we will be talking differently about this in a year. Right now, it's an exciting period because everyone is looking for solutions. But I don't know if I've found anyone yet who has done something that I found absolutely convincing. This is instead of live performance. And that's the big one for my art, my art form. We didn't receive any other question for the moment. So I, I, I just have to ask one thing. And, and I, I know that you said this in lots of interviews that after you did uh, Still Here, you spent your time trying to go uh, move yourself away from that image of the the person that knew mm -hmm. something about uh, how to deal with suffering and healing and all that. And then you, after that, you did still hear. Um, uh, it has a subtitle. I don't remember now. Twenty years after. Um, oh, the the, the uh, phantom uh, project. The phantom project. The phantom no, project. It's called. We call uh, it the Phantom Project, was yes. trying to bring back still here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the Phantom Project. But I, I was wondering, uh, but uh, with this moment, um, what did you learn? Is it possible to, to share something from that learning of that experience that you can share that we can use to think about what is to come after all this? How to mm -hmm. deal with this after. Right. Now, there used to be a litany of several things that I learned from survival workshop participants when I asked them, how do you, uh, how do you keep going? And they would say, uh, you must have a clear sense of purpose in your life. Now, this is a big one, isn't it? Um, do, and you must have a higher sense of purpose. For some people, it's religious. Or can you look at what you're doing and is there a higher purpose? I have a friend who is a restaurateur, but I found out recently that he was a practicing Buddhist who left it. And he said that he decided at a certain point in his Buddhism that everything that he did was going to be a, a practice. Um, so there was something about people living with life-threatening illness who really wanted life, that they had to learn how to believe in life believe in something, and they had to begin to feel themselves a part of a community. Now that is the COVID makes that very, um, it's a very perverse desire, isn't it? And with us self isolating as we are, but this will pass. But are we really a part of a community? One of the luxuries I think that many artists have is alienation. I am not one of them, at least I do, child of the counterculture, angry black men, all those things. I am not part of the culture. I am an individual. I don't believe it anymore. It's a painful truth, but I need everybody from the person who brings my groceries to the person who cleans my toilet because I have not cleaned my own toilet in years. I have a, a, a person who comes once a week, completely covered and cleans the toilet. I've had to have a new humility in some ways about the life that I have. And do I have a sense of, um, well, do I have a sense of a higher power? Do I have a sense that there is a mystery in the universe that I might uh, be able to express, but right now I don't, and I do. I have a sense of that I, there's something I have yet to learn about that. I used to say, and this sounds a little Christian, I don't want to come on that way, but I hope that with life I would have grace. And this is a, a notion, I think it's kind of a Christian notion, maybe a Judeo-Christian, public Christian notion, that there is something that comes from um, outside and it meets something on the inside that helps us understand how every moment, every breath we take is inevitable and complete. With that grace, I should never be angry again. With that grace, I should never worry about a bad review again, right? With that grace, I should never have to uh, worry about dying unsung. I shouldn't care about my legacy. I want grace. 
but that is an aspiration that is almost kind of a, an utopia is something that you well you can only we, wish for yes because we don't know people who have it do you yes. know people who, yes i think oh, i yeah. do yeah i think i do and that's not so important uh but i do think it's something that a child can look to me and say is this like santa claus does it really exist <laughs> and i could say uh yes i think so i hope so because that's a big part of the human game what you think and what you feel organize that thinking around the fact that there is something to aspire to now go for it generosity yeah yeah sorry I, i'm going to read the, well rafael Irish, thanks you very much um he, he appreciates, appreciates that you were pointing out mental health. There is another neotropic, I don't know. I would like to hear you speak more about your comment. Artists are the priests of our future. <laughs> oh, she's Aldana to... Bizarro. It's called <laughs> Aldana Bizarro. <laughs> it's a dancer. <desert. laughs> Well, uh, I, I used to feel that artists, art making was not a uh, job. It was a, a calling, like uh, people that go into the religious orders are it's a calling. I'm not quite sure anymore, but I do think that artists have this responsibility to present a model for the rest of humanity of a free, generous, clever, brave, uh, person. That's what artists are now. If that's what a priest does. Well, I think then an artist should aspire to that. Artists also have to accept that while they want to be this kind of priest-like person, they're also extremely egotistical. And artists are involved in their, themselves. That's where we go for our, our information. We dig into that. So artists have to be a priest who is aware of their I think most priests know that imperfection, aware of your imperfection, and yet you're brave and generous and you keep. If, you, if your work is to run into a wall every day, you rec realize that that's what your work is and you do it with a lighter heart, more generous heart. Now listen to me, this is a person who is always in a half empty state. I tend to be a depressive person. But when I speak like this, somehow something like religious feeling comes up. I feel like I'm speaking for everybody who calls himself an artist. I say that we are essential, we are important. Why, if you're so self-involved? We are as important as highways and hospitals. Now, I think that's what your whole Boca uh, enterprise is about. Culture is as important as highways and hospitals. Somebody said to me, well, what makes you think we're not more important than highways and hospitals? Ah. Now that's 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 difficult. Did I, did I do anything to do justice to this question about artists? Because it, it, it's too easy to say artists are the priests. Because many artists are horrible people. What they make is beautiful, sometimes, but they're not really. Not, it's not required that artists be um, good people, and it's not required. Is it required that a religious leader be a good person? We would like to think that, wouldn't we? And we're oftentimes disappointed. Artists have to be able to have the kind of feeling, that kind of religious feeling, but at the same time, self-critique. And artists should be members of a community. Now that's been a tough one for me to learn now. Have faith in being with others. Because for a long time, for whatever reasons, race, sexuality, whatever, I said, to hell with the world. The world doesn't love me and I don't love the world wasn't true, but artists do, particularly young artists have that feeling. And then if you're lucky, you grow past it. If you're lucky and then, or as I used to say, I wish my uh, colleagues who were talented formalists, I wish they had a great tragedy because now your form and your technique is at the service of something that is inevitable and powerful a great tragedy. Are we having a tragedy right now? So in other words, this, this COVID time is 
a kind of a gift to us. We can't pretend that we're living. We have to live. We can't pretend that we're part of this world. We have to be part of this world. And that's ecology and social ecology. Now, should I get off the soapbox right now? <laughs> that's where I end up at this moment. We are coming to, an end, to the end, but I also have another question here. Um, but we are coming, I'm telling everybody that we are coming to the end of the, this conversation. Uh, Tiago Bartolomeu Costa asks, being angry, as you said you are, do you treat space and time as a limitation or as a potential tool for creation? Being confined, <laughs> how aware must we be of romanticize of quarantine? Mm, how, uh, that's a very complicated question. Do you so, want me to? Repeat? Yeah, please, one more time, please. No. Yeah. Being angry, as you said you were, do you treat space and time as an, a limitation? or as a potential tool for creation in this moment. Mm. And being confined, how aware must we be of the possibility of romanticize uh, this state of quarantine? Well, I don't know who the person is, but I would tell Thiago that person- Bartomeu Costa, Thiago. Yes, I would in, in, in encourage this individual to look at the prison system Look at the life that the people in jail are leaving right now. They cannot leave. So no, there's no romance to, uh, to this, this kind of uh, isolation. There's no romance to it. And I would say that I believe that you should also look at the people who cannot afford to self-isolate. And how many of those people affect your life? And now, can you make gestures toward them? Can you sacrifice something so that they have more? That's the only answer I could give to this question. Uh, anger is only useful if it is a fuel that can be burned for a purpose, a good purpose. And uh, I think my anger is ancient. I'm still angry about slavery, you know? I'm angry about homophobia. I'm angry about the, the Bible and what it teaches about all sorts of things. But by the same token, I believe in beauty. And artists, we are supposed to be the alchemist of beauty. So anger and beauty, anger, beauty, time and space. They're so, uh, because I don't think we make our art, we don't make our art for dead people. We make our art for the living, no matter what the museums tell you, it's for the eyes that are looking at it right now. Can you really joyfully participate in this life in time and in space? Can you really own your anger, own your fear, own your lust, own your desire, and by the same token, not be ruled by them? Yeah. Bill D. Jones, I, can I ask you and to just ask three more questions that came out? And I say <laughs> it's it's closed. Okay, all right. I, cannot I, knew be this, I knew this would happen. This would happen. <laughs> At the very end, people they show up. But please, but let's I'm go. I'm saying now there are no more questions coming in. I do, sure. I'm just asking the ones that I have here. And this okay, is all right. Finished. Okay, good. I'm enjoying. <laughs> I'm enjoying. So, Beatriz Rodriguez, I work in film and photojournalism. Now, in quarantine, I started exper experimenting with self portrait. What could you tell me about starting to use the own body? as an object of art. <laughs> Please do it well. <laughs> you know, that's all I'm saying. I have, I have been prejudiced because of my generation against Instagram. Now I depend on Instagram. But when I go through and I look at the things that, po that people post, sometimes it just seems so narcissistic. It seems uh, like not uh, like children playing. And it's, we love children playing, but I think we need genius children playing with this medium. If you're gonna use your body, show me a body in a way I've never seen it before and care about what lands on my eyes. Don't hate me through your body. Love me through your body by loving your body, but not narcissism. So I'm saying, yes, your portraits, a lot of portraits have been done 
And now we all have these cameras. Do you really? Do you have an idea that transcends everything you know? I dare you. How did Diaghilev say? Astonish me. Astonish me. Second question. <laughs> Um, Ricardo Dias, what sort of advice would you give a young artist fresh out of school about <laughs> to initiate a career? He gives a virtual hug to you. <laughs> oh my God, you are, you are an evil person asking this question at this time. Although I understand what you're saying. It's always a hard, the world does not need, never has needed or wanted a hungry artist. You're directly out of school and you're trying to start a career. The world will tell you at every turn, we don't want you, we don't need you. You have got to do two things. You've got to say to the world, to hell with you. I do what I need to do because I believe in it. And also you have to understand how to be seductive. What do you know about, what do you have that the world wants? And what are you willing to trade for what you have and what the world wants? Sounds like I'm talking about prostitution of a sort. Guess what? There is something like that going on in the art world. Are you willing to do that? What do you have that the world wants? And what's your price? Last question. <laughs> Mariana Pinto Coelho, as an artist, do you think this precise moment should be a creative moment or a contemplative moment? <laughs> right. Well, I remind, a moment ago, I mentioned my friend who is a restaurateur, Japanese man, much loved. Um, and he was a practicing Buddha, Buddhist, who mm -hmm. left that and went into being a restaurateur when he could decide that everything that he was going to do was going to be as pure and as committed as his Buddhist practice. So, Yes, this is a contemplative moment, but it's also a moment about survival. And it's a moment about, um, let's make something new. You don't have to, but if you think that you're in the game of being a creative person, to really make something new. Don't be afraid to fail. This moment is not about everyone sitting, I don't know, maybe someone sitting 24 hours a day and, and meditating. That's wonderful if you, can, if you can afford it, if you can do it. But I don't think that's required right now. Are you splitting your time between taking care of your inner life and taking care of the world? Now that's a big, I'm, I'm gonna take my own advice on that one. How many of my hours are spent with my own concerns and how many of my hours are spent trying to build my New York Live Arts with Janet Wong, Kim Cullen, how much is being used talking to my friends in Lisbon. Why am I talking here? Oh, because I'm just great. I just want to be seen. But I actually think that we make a difference. The conversations might fall in the right ears. What about you? The person who's asking the question, how are you dividing each hour? How generous are you? How brave are you? I think this is a beautiful, um, uh, way to finish this interpolation of people to think about mm -hmm. themselves in this time. I thank you. And, very, and very the world, much. and the world. Yes. Think about yourself in the world. In the world. Yes. Um, I, I thank you very, very much. I won't abuse this generosity with the <laughs> lots of other questions that we would stay here for a long time. Uh, Thank you, thank you very, very much, Beauty Jones. And uh, Claudia, Claudia, you are wonderful, a delight to speak to, and thanks to John and all of the team at Boca, and good luck with your project. It's been my honor to be part of it. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.